Thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, uh, we're just delighted to see such a large and uh, diverse uh, group. So uh, by way of introduction, um, I'm on the board of directors of the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is situated headquarters in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, when Trump got elected, it became obvious, it was immediately obvious that immigration issues are, were going to be a very big deal. And uh, there are numerous detention centers located in the Deep South. This slide that's up on the board shows the locations of the three in Georgia and the one in Louisiana that uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, or the SPLC, the SPLC is involved in. And what we've done is we've staffed, uh, uh, we've, we've put together a skeleton law office in each of the location of these four ICE detention centers, but there's way too much work for the kind of staff that we could put there. And so we're running on the basis of staff plus volunteer lawyers that come down for a week at a time. And uh, during the next 20, 30 minutes, we want to talk to you a little bit about our independent experiences down there. We didn't go together. I went in June. Larry, what month did you go in? October. And uh, how it affected us. And we will, as we're talking about it and talking about the issue, we will tell you about how the program works and what you might expect if you'd volunteer. Uh, we're here hoping that some of you will volunteer. Uh, I understand there's some paralegals in this group. There is work for paralegals also. So uh, that's our goal, is to uh, share with you the depth of the experience that we had, and, and hopefully uh, some of you will, uh, will take a chance and, and, and spend a week doing this work. If you are put in one of these places, you're given what's called a notice of appear. It's like an indictment. The government then has an obligation to prove one thing, that you're here without what's called here without inspection, meaning you got into the country without a visa or you came in illegally. Then the burden of proof shifts completely to the detainee. The first step is to try and get bond. Bond requires that you prove only two things, that you're not a flight risk and you have no criminal record. Everybody I talk to fit into that category, except occasionally somebody was busted for driving without a license. <coughs> which in Georgia is a crime, okay? And that was used as a basis to deny bond. Now here's the important fact, and this is where you come in as paralegals and lawyers. Nationally, <coughs> bond applications are allowed in 46% of the cases. Bond, bond is the equivalent of bail. Yeah, and it's usually two to $5,000, which is very hard for these <coughs> folks to raise, and it's often raised by their church or their employer. 46% nationally. Bond is allowed. In Stewart Detention Center in Lumpkin, Georgia, Correction Corporation of America, which owns the place, a private prison company now called Core Civic, gives 35 cents a day to the city government for every detainee kept there. Okay? So 46% chance of getting bond nationally in, in Stewart Detention Center, it's 2%. 98% of the people that end up in Stewart get deported. If you get out on bond, and by the way, if you have a lawyer, you have a 10 times better chance of getting out on bond. Only 6% of the people in Stewart have a lawyer, as opposed to, four, or compared to 14% nationally. But even if you, have, if, you, if you have a lawyer, you have a 10 times better chance of getting out on bond. And if you get out on bond, you have a 30 times better chance of winning your merits case. And just stop and think about it. First of all, there's no rule against hearsay in these hearings. The burden of proof shifts to the detainee. And then you've got to start assembling documents like this letter from the doctor and a letter from the employer and a letter from your church, and a letter from your neighbor, and a letter from your best friend. And if you're, if you're an uh, asylum seeker from one of the countries where you might be killed, you put in newspaper articles about MS-13 and how your brother was killed, and how that you, you get police records that you've gone to the police, 
and that the police have maybe investigated an attempt on your life. Can you imagine trying to do that while you're locked up and you want to make a phone call? Each one costs five bucks. And you only speak Spanish. And you only speak Spanish. So paralegals and Eldon and I would spend time on the phone calling people saying, can you give us a letter speaking up for Miguel and tell him he's been a member of your church for the last 25 years? You know, because that proves he's not a flight risk, right? That he's got a family, all that sort of stuff. He's got an employee. Uh, he's employed, all those sorts of things. And when you get this packet of paper, it's about this high. And that is then submitted to the immigration judge on the merits hearing. But to try and assemble that at a, uh, if you're not allowed out on bond is just about impossible. So there's a 30 times better chance of winning a merits case if you get out on bond. And if you have a lawyer, there's a 10 times better chance you're going to win your bond hearing. So, so lawyers really, really make a difference. So let me tell you a little bit about how, how, how the program works. If you, you want to volunteer, you can, you can volunteer online. You can pick the week that you want to go down there. I knew no immigration law, none, zero, when I signed up. Uh, there is an online tutorial that is provided that you can go through at your own speed and learn a little bit of immigration law. Then uh, you show up at any of the four facilities that you get assigned to and uh, on a Sunday around noon and there's a Sunday afternoon seminar put on by our staff. Then you go to work on Monday and you work all week. Now uh, I did two bond hearings. Uh, Larry didn't do any bond hearings. It's, it's a, you never know whether you're going to actually get into court. I don't think they would have a pro bono lawyer who doesn't have immigration law background do an actual asylum hearing. I think staff would be doing that. But, but you might do bond hearings. You might go to asylum hearings. You might help. Steve Manning is a lawyer here in Portland. Anybody know him? So Steve has developed something, uh, a software platform that is being used nationwide by the Southern Poverty Law Center and other nonprofits that are doing ICE detention center work, which allows those of us who do a one week pro bono stint to go in, interview a client, come back to the office using your laptop, get onto the software, enter detailed notes about what happened in your interview, enter what you need to do. You know, we've got to get a driver's license from the DMV. We've got to get his, the, the criminal record. We've got to get his school records. You know, lay it out in this software. You, can, you may start doing that work while you're there, but then you leave on Friday, somebody else shows up, they get assigned to work on that bond hearing, they open up the software platform and they can pick right up from where, from where you've been. So it's a pretty well-organized program. When you get down there, you may well work on, on, on cases that people have been, had interviewed a week, two, three, four weeks ago, or a case that's going to come up for hearing that very week. It's just hard to know. Um, when I was down there, there were law students down there. There was a Spanish teacher that had volunteered to come down and work as a volunteer for a week. Um, and there was a middle-aged lawyer and me. So they're just all kind of people that might be there at any given time. What was your experience along that line, Larry? Well, my son and I were the only two volunteers there that week. By the way, don't be intimidated if you don't speak Spanish. They'll find a way to help you. Uh, and uh, uh, they'll get somebody to, to help you do that. <laughs> Uh, you can imagine it's still a cumber cumbersome process because the interview itself is probably an hour and a half. Um, let me just make another comment. Uh, a cynic might say, well, we get these folks out on bail, uh, we'll never see them again. Get them out on bond, they'll just disappear. They won't show up for the merits hearing, right? <coughs> they'll just meld into the society and there'll be another illegal person without legal status there. Well, this has been studied. And I thought you'd ask that question. The University of uh, Pennsylvania Law Review studied 16,000 cases. And in its December 2015 um, edition, it wrote an article entitled National Study of Access to Counsel in Immigration Court, written by two law professors. The important part for you to arm you with this argument, should anybody give it you the argument that you get the folks out on bond and they'll disappear, let me just cite you this. Over the six year period studied, only 32% of non-detained 
pro se respondents showed up in court. In other words, people out on bond, they weren't in detention, but they were pro se. Only 32% of those showed up, okay? Compared to 93% of non-detained respondents with counsel, okay? 93% of the non-detained <coughs> people that were having a merits hearing that were out on bond that had counsel showed up three times the amount of people that didn't have counsel. So the argument that this law review article makes, you get lawyers, it makes the system more efficient. Okay? It and makes we, the system you know, more efficient. One thing we haven't mentioned is, although there's no right to a pro bono lawyer in this system, there is clear Supreme Court precedent that these folks have the right to a lawyer. Not if a court-appointed lawyer. If, the, if they can retain one or, their, or a pro bono lawyer shows up. It is, it is a right under our Constitution. To, to have representation. Larry, why don't you share that article about the uh, follow-up on people got, that got deported? And yeah, there's another article here that uh, is easily accessible on Google if you want to, but also if you subscribe to The New Yorker. January 15, 2018, it's called When Deportation is a Death Sentence. Um, it's written by a, with the help of Columbia University Law School professors and this uh, uh, journalist, they followed uh, 60 uh, people that were detained and then deported. And the majority of them, when they arrived back to where they were deported to, the majority of the 60 were murdered. And the balance of them were seriously injured or harmed through violence. Okay. What, what, wasn't it that they looked at more than 60 people? Oh, yeah, they looked at more than 60, but yeah. they followed 60 cases. And they followed it very closely. They went to the mortuaries. They went to the hospitals. They went to the courts. It's a very uh, detailed um, analysis. So the point is that with a lawyer, they have a 30 times better chance if they can get out on bond, 10 times better chance in getting out on bond, you're saving someone's life. That's the point, and maybe it's not time to editorialize, but I will. I don't think I have ever seen a situation where there have been more powerless people that can benefit more from a lawyer's help. And, and, I, and I would say, as someone who's done civil rights cases my whole career, that I don't think I ever got involved in a situation that was as emotional and heartrending. You know, uh, I'm Jewish. My uh, mother's parents left Russia just before the Bolshevik Revolution. My, uh, my grandfather, my mother's father, would have been drafted into the army. And during World War I, the Jewish regiments were put out in front. Uh, my dad got out of Germany just before World War II broke, broke out. So it's no uh, misstatement <coughs> to say I would not be here, I would not be alive, if the United States had not allowed my family into this country when there was the threat of violence back where they came from. Uh, I interviewed these, these men, and it was, it was heartrending. I, I, when I came back, somebody asked me, what was your experience like? And I said it was depressing. It embarrassed me the way the United States government was treating human beings. Uh, and uh, I thought it was one of the most important things I'd, I had done in my career, and it radicalized me which is why uh, I'm here today. It, it totally radicalized me on this issue. Uh, so, um, let's just make a comment. Think, think about it for a minute. There's at least five pathways for these folks to find a legal, legal status in the United States. We know that. Part of it is treaties that have been adopted by our uh, Senate, ratified by our Senate, at least two of the treaties that apply. And we find that the most effective way to deal with this is to systematically deprive people of counsel so that they can't exercise those rights that we have ascribed to and subscribed to. I mean, it, it just to me, it doesn't sound like the rule of law. I mean, people say, well, people come into the country, they don't respect the rule of law. Well, here's where the rule of law is not being respected either, it seems to me. These folks have rights. These, these treaties... These asylum treaties where people are threatened with violence or death, we're not the only signatory. They've been signed by countries throughout the, the world. We're just one country of many 
that have signed these treaties. And I'll just leave you with this thought because I think it kind of summarizes it. This is by Camille Mackler, Director of Legal Initiatives for the New York Immigration Coalition. She said, I don't think everyday Americans would expect such dramatic punishment to be given without the person having a fair chance to make their case. So I put up on the board how you sign up. Um, the last time we gave this presentation, we were in a room with nobody had a ballpoint pen. I see one. <laughs> but uh, this is how you sign up. It, you can do it online. There's more information online. Angela Nair, be glad to talk to you. You can email us. She'll be glad to talk to you. Uh, we're glad to answer any questions anybody might have.